So here you see the various phases of the French Revolution, starting with the absolute monarchy of Louis the Sixteenth, moving through the constitutional monarchy, however brief, the radical republic um, formed by the Jacobins, the reign of terror, where we really have a dictatorship under Robespierre, the directory or the directorate, and finally Napoleon. We're going to talk about Napoleon now. But before I really get into um, our discussion of him, here's a few interesting facts about Napoleon. He suffered from something called aleurophobia. He was afraid of cats. Also, if you lived then or even now in France, you would know that it is illegal to name a pig Napoleon. It's considered to be um, dishonoring, dishonorable to Napoleon Bonaparte. So, if you lived in France and you read the book Animal Farm, or even if you just read a French version of the book Animal Farm, you'll find that the pig is named Caesar instead of Napoleon. He was a bit of a narcissist, and so he used to dress up in poor clothing, and he'd walk around the streets of Paris just asking people questions. That way, he could judge how popular he was. Um, also, Napoleon supposedly had a photographic memory. Um, he's considered to be a mili great military strategist and a battlefield genius. In fact, even today, people, uh, military men, still look and y look at and use some of his strategies in warfare and in battle. He was actually married twice. Um, he was married to a woman named Josephine, who he loved dearly, but she couldn't bear him heirs. So he got rid of her. He divorced her, married another woman, Maria Louise, or Marie Louise, the Archduchess of Austria, and they had a son who would go on to rule France for two weeks in 1814. So, what else do we know about Napoleon? Well, Napoleon existed as a great man, as a leader of France, because of the French, French Revolution. And in a few moments, we're going to discuss what that means. Here are the terms. Uh, make sure you get them all, and we will be talking about them. In 1801, an artist named David painted Napoleon crossing the Alps. So here you see that painting. And I want you to just think for a moment, what image of Napoleon does this convey? Well, he's portrayed as a military genius, a great romantic hero. He's showing strength. Um, you know, would you follow this guy? And also, if you look down at the bottom, you see some stones with names engraved. These are the names of great military leaders of the past. Um, and at the top, you've got Bonaparte, his own name. Um, Hannibal, for example, just below the stone containing Bonaparte. Hannibal was a great Carthaginian leader who lived back during the Roman Republic and engaged the Romans in a series of wars known as the Punic Wars. But he's known to be also a great military genius. So Napoleon is identifying himself with these men. So how, do, how realistic do you think this painting is? Well, it's pure propaganda. Because he did cross the Alps on a mule. So how dashing and romantic would he look on the back of a mule? How powerful would he look on the back of a mule? Not too much. David, the painter, was trying to cultivate Napoleon's favor by promoting his image in a positive light. So here you see um, a painting, Napoleon in his study. Um, and one interesting thing, too, you know, a lot of people always talk about Napoleon being really short. You know, the Napoleon, the Napoleonic complex, the Napoleon complex. Um, so he's characterized as being really short, but that's not really the case. Um, on the one hand, people back then did tend to be shorter than people today, but 
Evidence shows that Napoleon may have actually been slightly taller than the average European at the time he lived, somewhere between five foot six and five foot eight. So he wasn't really that short. So here you see his wife Josephine, who he loved very much, but who he divorced when he discovered she could not give him an heir. And here you see Napoleon as a young man, um, as a young soldier, dashing young guy. Um, he made a name for himself in the military and became a bit of a military he um, hero. And something interesting about Napoleon, he was born into a lower class family, but he was sent off to military school and because of the chaos of the French Revolution, because of the new status quo, so to speak, um, the idea that you could earn your way up in society through your own talent and hard work, rather than having to be born into a certain position. Because of that, Napoleon is able to climb the ranks of the military. And so he will start at the bottom, but move his way to the top. Napoleon led a military campaign down into Egypt. He was actually an avid Egyptologist and it was under his um, leadership that the Rosetta Stone was discovered. And in case you're not familiar with the Rosetta Stone, it is a stone that was found that contained one message in three languages. At the um, top you have Egyptian hieroglyphics. In the middle you have a language called Demotic, and then at the bottom you have a kind of modern form of Greek. And it was written during a period known as the Hellenistic Age, which was the 300 years after Alexander the Great. It's a period when Egypt was being ruled by Greeks, and there's a blending of the Greek culture with Egyptian culture and many other cultures. And so, what scholars did was they translated the Greek, and then they got to the Demotic. Now, this was a mixture of Greek and hieroglyphics. And using the Greek that they knew, they deciphered that and then filled in the spaces for the hieroglyphs. Then, once they'd done that, they worked backward and deciphered the hieroglyphs. And this was very, very important because it unlocked the key to knowing ancient Egypt. Because up to that point in the early um, 1800s, a lot of documents had been found, but none of them could be translated. Now they could. Napoleon greatly benefited from the French Revolution and all the political disorder that went along with it. Um, as I said, he had made a name for himself in the military. He was able to demonstrate his talents on the battlefield. Um, France went to war with her European rivals. You know, I mentioned Austria, Prussia, Russia. They want to stifle that French disease, the, the ideas. So France is at war, and he used some really imaginative battlefield techniques. He combined speed, surprise, and deception to demoralize his opponents and weaken their will to fight. He would attack when it was least expected. For example, he fought on Sunday, at night, and in the rain, things you didn't do. And, like I mentioned a moment ago, he greatly benefited from all the, pos the political disorder in France in the late 1790s. Well. What happens is the Directory finds itself under siege. Um, there are groups of people who want to overthrow it. And so Napoleon comes with the troops to save the Directory. He becomes even more a hero. However, not long after that, he is going to overthrow it himself. Um, with the help of several other men, they overthrow the Directory in November of 1799 and he becomes the new ruler of France. He becomes the first consul. So here you see Napoleon as first consul. Now initially this was to be a 10-year position and he agrees in 1799. But 
But then, in 1802, he's like, well, you know what? You know, I'm so good at this. I just need to do it for the rest of my life. So he names himself First Consul for Life. In 1804, he crowned himself emperor. Literally crowned himself. Thousands watched as he took the crown from the Pope's hands and placed it on his own, own head. Now, typically, the Popes crowned the kings and queens of Europe. Napoleon, though, like I just said, takes that crown out of the Pope's hands and places it on his own head. What message is he sending? Well, he is saying on the one hand that he is more powerful than the Pope. He's above the Pope. Also, by crowning himself emperor, he ended the charade. The French Revolution had been founded on democracy. Napoleon rolled back the tide of democracy by declaring himself a crowned head of Europe. It was the death of the Republic and the birth of the Empire. And this is a painting um, painted by David, who was the same artist who did the um, Napoleon crossing the Alps. And what's really interesting about this painting is it's huge. It's not just a painting in a frame. It's an entire wall. And David actually did two of them. There's one in Versailles, um, because Napoleon actually lived there. And there's another one in the Louvre in Paris. The only difference is if you see um, some three women, several women standing in the front over towards the left, um, in one of the paintings, their dresses are blue, in another, they're pink. Otherwise, David just completely reproduced this thing. And here you see a close-up. So, he becomes emperor. So, here you see Emperor Napoleon. Now, he wanted to restore the glory of France and to attain European control. He was greedy for power, war, and conquest. There are several interpretations for his success. The first interpretation argues that he betrayed the ideals of the revolution. According to this interpretation, he anticipated the authoritarian policies of 20th century dictators yet to come. What I mean by that is he's doing the same things people like Hitler and Mussolini did a century plus before. He concentrated all the power to himself. He controlled the press, the arts, etc. He suppressed all opposition. He used public opinion to enhance himself and his image. He restored slavery. He restricted and in many cases put down liberty and freedom. He manipulated the political process. For example, he would hold elections. People would come, they'd vote, they'd be excited because they had a voice. What they didn't know was that the outcome of the election was already determined. Those votes weren't going to be counted. And so he used all the bells and whistles of modern day politics to rise to power and then gave people the illusion of participation through elections and assemblies. But they were all really frauds. He ruled through a military dictatorship. And very important, he put the glory of the nation over the rights of the individuals. So for him, the collective was more important than individual rights. So that's one interpretation. What about the other interpretation? Well, it argues that he's the last of the enlightened despots. It argues that he's the heir to the French Revolution. He took the concepts of the Enlightenment and institutionalized them. He put them into effect. He introduced his own reforms and ideas. He gave France more efficiency, order, and state power than any previous government. For example, he tried to make or create a standardized government. He created the prefect system. This is a system in which administrative officers called prefects were appointed by him, by Napoleon. 
and they supervised affairs in the different regions of France. There were 180 different regions. And they took care of things like tax collection, military recruitment, and maintaining order. This was a huge improvement over the chaos of the old regime. So he centralized and standardized the government. Also, what did he do? Well, he believed education was very important. And so he created a public education system with a secular curriculum. He stimulated industry and trade by building roads, canals, and bridges. He founded the Bank of Paris. He allowed peasants to keep the farmland they'd received during the revolution. He never restored the special privileges of the aristocracy. And then, in 1801, there was the Concordat, one of the key legacies of Napoleon's rule. This was an agreement he made with the Pope, which healed the division within the French Catholic Church. So as I said, the Concordat was an agreement with the Pope. It healed the division within the French Catholic Church. What had happened was that in the 1790s, during the Revolution, a lot of Catholic priests resisted the new secular policies. Um, they resisted the fact that the new government was taking church lands and selling them, um, closing down church offices. And so it created a division within the church and between the church and the government. So the Concordat was intending to regulate church and state affairs. And it also healed this division. And that healing allowed Napoleon to remove a source of opposition. So now he can use the church to promote French Catholic unity. Another great legacy was the Code Napoleon. Um, you might also see it written as the Napoleonic Code. This was instituted between 1804 and 1810. This ended the legal chaos in France. Um, there had been nearly 200 overlapping law codes, which made things really confusing. So you might go to one region of France and, say, steal a loaf of bread and get a slap on the hand. You might go to another region of France, steal a loaf of bread, and be in prison for 10 years. So what the Code Napoleon did was it standardized the law. It did away with local customs and traditions all laws in France would now be the same. So it introduced one law code which was standardized and unified. It provided uniformity everywhere in France. It ratified legal equality. It protected private property and allowed careers to flourish through talent rather than birth. There were some negatives to the code, unfortunately. Women were legally subordinate to men, and labor unions were banned, because labor unions could be a source of opposition. This is still the basis of French law, and virtually every law code in Africa and Asia stemmed from the Code Napoleon. One reason for this, the main reason, is that many countries in Africa and Asia were controlled by the French during the age of imperialism. And so when they later gained their independence in the 20th century, they looked to France and its institutions as they created their own governments. Well, whatever the case may be, and whichever argument is correct, Napoleon came very far, very quickly, and he made a lot of changes. He wanted to create what he called his Grand Empire. And he was going to attempt to assert French mastery over the entire continent of Europe in order to do so. But despite his military victories on the continent, his Grand Empire is eventually going to break his back, as did his quest for power and glory. So what did he do? Well, he starts to conquer neighbors and in the satellite states, defeated in battle, he appointed family members to rule. For example, in Spain and part of the Italian peninsula, they all answered to him. He annexed the areas he controlled. They became part of his empire. 
The areas he conquered had to abide by his rule. They had to become his allies, whether they wanted to or not. So what are some of the reasons for the demise of his empire? One reason for the demise of his empire was his failure to defeat Great Britain. In 1805, at the Battle of Trafalgar, um, off the coast of Spain, the British Navy defeated French forces. This ensured British mastery and supremacy of the high seas off the coast of Spain and in the Atlantic. Napoleon was not happy. In response to this, and in the hopes of defeating Great Britain one way or another, Napoleon organized a trade embargo. This was the continental system, an attempt to cut off British trade with continental Europe, most of which he's create, uh, he was controlling. He hoped it would lead to chaos in Britain. But there were some problems with it. One big problem with the continental system was that it did not work. The British simply traded more with their colonies. Also, he kind of shot himself in the foot because French industry lagged far behind British industry. And so it turns out they couldn't really produce a lot of the goods they needed. And smuggling interfered and created even more problems. Another reason for the demise of his empire was what Napoleon called, quote, my Spanish ulcer. Spain was controlled by Napoleon. He had conquered it. But it drained and strained him of life-giving forces. In 1808, a peninsular war began in Spain. The Spanish revolted. They wanted their independence. And the French soldiers were sent in to invade um, Spain to enforce French policies. And they entered a guerrilla war situation. The Spanish worked together to defend their faith and their land from the French imposition. And this forced Napoleon to send more supplies and troops, many more than he had planned. The continued fighting also gave Britain the opportunity to land troops in Spain and to help the Spaniards fight the French. And ultimately, together, they pushed the French back into southern France. And if you're interested in this, there's a very good series of books about these wars um, about a British officer named Sharp, S-H-A-R-P-E. And there's a series um, of books, as I said, takes place during the Napoleonic Wars. They were also made into movies for the BBC. and They're very factual. They give you a very good view of what this period of time was like. Well, a third reason for the collapse of Napoleon's empire was that the longer the empire lasted, the more resistance he faced from conquered subjects. French forces represented liberty equality, and other progressive reforms of the revolution. They were ideals that undermined the old regimes. And these old regimes, places like Austria, Russia, they wanted no part of these ideas. His armies also symbolized conquest and exploitation of resources through taxes, recruits, and economic hardships that they placed on their conquered subjects. There was a lot of resentment of French mastery, and this led to resistance movements in Spain, Austria, Prussia, and Russia. Another reason for the demise of his empire was Napoleon's disastrous decision to wage war against Russia. This was the straw that broke his back. France and Russia were bitter rivals for commercial and strategic influence in the eastern Mediterranean. Russia also said no to the continental system, refused to cooperate. So, this led Napoleon to form his Grand Army. This was a huge army composed of 500,000 men. And in June of 1812, he invaded Russia. He hoped to march to Moscow and deliver a quick knockout blow. But it didn't work out that way. As Napoleon and his troops entered Russia, 
they encountered the Russians who were, were retreating and luring them into the interior, burning land and livestock and so on as they went. What this meant was that Napoleon and his army had no resources because armies back then, um, you know, they didn't carry all the supplies they needed for a long campaign like this. And it's not like there's a super Walmart they can stop in to to, to buy food for 500,000 plus men. So they lived off the land. And what the Russians are doing is taking that away from them. The Russian strategy was time and space. In August of 1812, the Russians took a stand outside Moscow in the Battle of Borodino. Um, if you ever read War and Peace by Tolstoy, it, it depicts this battle. Napoleon's goal at Borodino was to destroy the Russian army. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. He ended up losing thousands of his men. And even today, historians debate who actually won this battle. Um, in general, it's said that Napoleon won only because the Russians retreated. But what happens is he finally is able to enter the city of Moscow. And when he entered Moscow, he discovered that a fire had gutted most of the city. It left he it left him and his army without food or shelter. They're trapped. The Russian Tsar, to make matters worse, rejected all peace talks until the French were gone and an early Russian winter set in. So Napoleon is trapped in Russia and he's so stubborn that he refuses to leave. He was determined. We finally get to October of 1812 and Napoleon realizes he's not going to win this battle. So he finally does order a retreat and the result was a nightmare. Hunger, frost, and disease devastated his army. You know, imagine you're one of these soldiers. You've been marching by foot for months. This is, what, four plus months after you began. What are your boots going to look like? You know, you might have holes in the bottom, bottom of your boots. And again, there's nowhere you can go to replace them. And the temperatures were frigid. It gets really, really cold in Russia. It was so cold that the oil in their lamps was freezing. So his retreat from Russia, as I said, was just a total disaster. The soldiers were so hungry that some of them actually tried to carve into the carcasses of horses as they died, only to discover that the carcasses were freezing before they could do this. And to make matters worse, the Russian army pursued them all the way back to the outskirts of Paris. Out of the 500,000 men who had left France, less than 50,000 returned. And this goes a long way towards Napoleon losing power because the French people were tired of war. They were frustrated and angry that he had just lost nearly half a million young men. So Napoleon ends up losing power and if you click um, on the arrow you'll see a circle around a little island off the coast of Italy, Elba Island. It's here that Napoleon is imprisoned. He's under house arrest. Um, unfortunately he was pretty wily and what people didn't realize was that he was actually working with people who supported him back in France and secretly he raised an army. If you ever read The Count of Monte Cristo, it talks about this and about the spies and the people working with Napoleon. So Napoleon escapes from Elba Island, meets up with his army that he has raised secretly, and they engage in battle against the coalition army, which is composed of soldiers from Britain, Russia, Prussia, and Austria. And they meet at the Battle of Waterloo in Belgium. And this will be Napoleon's final defeat. What's really interesting though is why he actually lost. The battle was supposed to start at 6 a.m. but it had been really rainy in the days leading up to the battle. The 
the battlefield was muddy and so they postponed it till 9 and then nearly midday. At the same time, Napoleon had suffered an acute attack of hemorrhoids several days earlier. And now normally he'd be out there riding among his troops, supervising everything. But he hadn't been doing that. And two days earlier, um, his doctors who had been treating him with leeches actually lost the leeches that they used to relieve the pain. And they accidentally overdosed him with laudanum. And so we get to the day of the battle, and he's still kind of groggy the morning of the battle. He's still kind of groggy from the laudanum. He's soaking in a hot tub, and he's just kind of drifting, and the time passes, and the time passes. And so, end result, he loses this battle. He loses power, and that's the end of Napoleon. After Waterloo, if you click again, you'll see um, St. Helena. After Waterloo, Napoleon is imprisoned once again. But this time, they're like, okay, we're going to put him out where he can't get into contact with anybody. So he's imprisoned on the island of St. Helena off the coast of Africa. And it's here he lives until he passes away in 1821, most likely from cancer. And here you see Napoleon's tomb in Paris. Um, his body was later moved to Paris where it was buried. So Napoleon is crucial in shaping Western civilization. What is his legacy? After 25 years, France had good, had good legal institutions. They had legal equality, careers based on merit, religious toleration, no preferences or special privileges given to religious leaders. He accelerated the process of social and political progress. He gave France a constitution. He improved industry and trade. He set up a public education system. But, after 1789, no old regime in Europe would be completely confident. They will all be on the defensive against new political ideals. But Napoleon and his wars caused a lot of suffering. So, was he a savior or a devil? Some of the positive aspects of his character were that he saw himself as a savior. He saw himself as an enlightened man. He rose through merit, not the privilege of status. He was creative and imaginative. Education was very important to him. He felt education was the way for people to improve themselves. He was a conqueror and a military expansionist. He was an explorer who studied Egyptology, and under his command, many of the tombs in Egypt were opened and studied. In regards to economic reform, he believed it was within the power of the state to provide a stable economy and a just and fair tax system. He was a patriot. He epitomized the ideals of the French Revolution. He was in love with France and felt it must be protected from all enemies. He believed in exporting his revolution in order to export the ideas of liberty, equality, and patriotism. But there were also negatives. He was an egomaniac who loved nothing better than himself. He came to believe he was the state. He was warlike. France was at war nearly every year that he was in control. His motto was that, quote, Peace is simply a time of rest between wars, end quote. He was an expansionist and an imperialist who believed in total war. Every person in the state was taught to believe in total war, to muster every piece of your society and economy to back the war, to dedicate all the resources of the state to the war. This idea of total war began during the French Revolution and was legitimized by Napoleon. He undermined the principle of power to the people, liberty, equality, fraternity. 
He rejected the ideal of true democracy put forth by the French Revolution. In setting himself up as first consul and then emperor, he set himself up as dictator. He was expressing his own political authoritative will, not that of the people. And so really, he only mouthed the words of democracy. A short time before his death, Napoleon attempted to justify all he had done during his life. He wrote, Such work as mine is not done twice in a century. I have saved the revolution as it lay dying. I have cleansed it of its crimes, and have held it up to the people shining with fame. I have inspired France and Europe with new ideas that will never be forgotten. A later French statesman and writer, Alexis de Tocqueville, summed up Napoleon's character by saying, quote, He was as great as a man can be without virtue. End quote. And there you have Napoleon. And here you see the various phases of the French Revolution again. Um, this is the same as the first slide. And if you just click the down arrow, you'll see the various phases appear.